Okay, I felt like it was not satisfactory when I talked about uh, the universe okay. and then uh, nakedness in the Word of God. So uh, I really didn't cover the verses, you know. So this, I want to go through one by one, okay? So let's go through this. This is very interesting, okay? Mm -hmm. I drew it out as well so you can see clearly. Okay, fresh review. Remember this is that I'm not going to show you the verse because I showed it to you last time. But remember, uh, the Lord inhabits all the universe. So the universe is practically his clothing because he fills up heaven and earth. I've given you verses on that one. So if this universe is God's clothing, think about it. The Bible points out <clears throat> that uh, when the universe itself is gone, uh, heaven and earth is gone, the reason why is because before the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the Lord is revealing himself. So when the Lord God exposes himself in his full holiness, in his full glory, the universe cannot stand the holiness of God, so it runs away. So remember, if God is uh, naked, that's the idea. If he exposes his whole holiness for what he truly is, uh, then everything would evaporate. Everything, people cannot stand it. I've told you about damn sinners who go to hell. That would actually be something merciful to them because God's holiness is all exposed this time. The reason why we can still exist, we're okay, is that universe, see? The universe is still there, which is God's clothing that I pointed you verses on. So that covered God. But when that universe is gone, God's clothing is gone. And Revelation 20 that we saw last time showed him within his full presence when the universe is gone. That shows, and then everybody's standing before the great white throne and they're in dread. They're in great dread and fear. Now, understanding the nakedness of God with his holiness, let's compare it with mankind. Mankind, with their nakedness, it's full of shame, it's full of sin. But originally, it's not so. <clears throat> Where did clothing come from? Why do we all wear clothes today? Why can't we be, think about this, why can't we be as naked as God? What makes us different from God? Well, God had to be clothed because the Sin cannot hold him. Sin cannot stand it. We live in sinful creation, remember. So all of uh, mankind cannot stand that. That's why it's his mercy, so that universe is his clothing. So mankind, in their nakedness, is filled with sin as well. Right. The evidence that I pointed out was Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2, Adam and Eve, they were naked and were not ashamed. So that's before they sin. But after they sin, Genesis chapter 3, sin is in the picture. So what do you have to do with your nakedness when sin's involved? You have to cover yourself. So you clothe. That's why they had to put on clothes. Same thing with God. Because of the existence of sin, God had to clothe himself so that his holiness would not be in conflict uh, in the presence or with the existence of humans who are in sin. Because remember, if God uh, opened up, uh, if God got rid of his clothing, the universe, then that sin and that holiness would collide and then it, it just couldn't exist. There's no way. So it's God's mercy that we are still able to breathe and exist <clears throat> because of his clothing, the universe. But that's also the reason why mankind, they have to close themselves. The reason why they have to clothe themselves is because of sin. So we saw that in Genesis 2 and 3. Now, what we're going to look at is the meaning of it. The meaning of uh, nakedness is two definitions here. The two definitions uh, with nakedness that I pointed out is Hebrews chapter 4, all right? But well, why don't we turn over there, all right? Let's, let's start all over on that one, all right? I want you to go to Job 1 and then Hebrews 4. Job 1 and Hebrews 4. <clears throat> now the word naked, there are two meanings to this. There are two meanings to this. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Verse 12, the Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now look at 13, that's the key. 
<coughs> oh, excuse me. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are what? Naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. <coughs> so notice right here the definition of nakedness is everything being exposed. Everything being open. That matches with this one, right? When the universe is gone, then God reveals himself. He's totally open, right? His holiness. That's why sin cannot stand that. So that matches up so far. Uh, let's also look at Job 1. Job 1. So when mankind is naked, he's so open, right? When he's openly revealing his flesh, the flesh is full of sin, is it not? The by, uh, we know those verses. Paul said that what's, uh, the things that are in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. It's sinful. So see, when we are naked in our flesh, it's full of sin that's being revealed. When God is naked, then it's all of holiness. So that matches with what I told you before. See, they would collide then. That's why both sides have to clothe themselves. Both sides have to clothe themselves. When you see a bunch of demented squirrels going around not clothing themselves, see, that is, that is total abomination, direct conflict. You notice that our society don't even run like that, too. They put rules on clothing. Why? Because that, there's no way you can uh, really exist that way. That's not a sane world. There's something there in our conscience that knows that it has to be clothed. <clears throat> Job 1. Verse 21, 21, and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. So nakedness is also connected to birth, our birth. So then, remember this, from birth, we are naked. Naked also means open. And basically, all of it comes down to shame and sin. We can agree so far, right? All it comes down to is shame and sin. So that's the reason why there is something wrong with our nakedness, our naked flesh. Because it's filled with sin. It's connected to our, notice, birth, right? Nakedness is connected to birth, correct? Mm -hmm. So then, look at Genesis 17. Genesis 17. Why do you think God demanded circumcision? so that the people can be in communion with him. What is circumcision? It is a certain part of the body that is cut off. What part of the body is that? That's connected to birth. Oh, wow. okay. See that? Where the seed comes from. Okay, it's better when I'm going one by one now, isn't it? So, so that's the reason why there's circumcision. Why? A cutting off of that. Because it's corrupt. It's sinful. It's making a lot of sense, right? So think about this. God, who is holy, cannot communicate with man because their naked side is sinful. So the naked side that's sinful must be cut off. How do you cut it off? Through circumcision. That's why. Because nakedness is connected to birth. And that's all connected to shame and sin. Okay, now you wonder why Jews practice that. So go to Genesis chapter 17. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 17. Verse 14, what happened? Uh, verse 13, verse 13. Genesis 17, 13. He that is born in thine house. See, you're born. And Job said, naked came I out of my mother's womb. When you're born, you're born with nakedness. What does God want you to do with that nakedness? And he that is bought with thy money must needs be what? Circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your what? Flesh, flesh for an everlasting covenant. See, there's something wrong with their naked flesh. So they have to circumcise that. That way God, he can be able to have somewhat of a communion. Now go to verse 14. And the uncircumcised man child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be what? Cut off from his people, he hath broken my covenant. Look at that. God wants him separated from him. Yeah. That's serious. What happens to people who are lost in sin? They are separated from God. 
because they are still lost in their naked flesh in sin. See that? So God cuts them off. And that cutting off, that circumcision is their soul being damned in hell. Think about that one. That's the reason why the Jews had to practice circumcision that whole time. Think about it. That's the reason why circumcision was sometimes connected to salvation and Jews thought of it that way. But what changed everything? Ah, Colossians. Here we go, Colossians 2. God decided to do a different circumcision. And this circumcision completely cut us off from our corrupted birth line in our flesh, our naked flesh. Didn't you know that all of you are cut off from that right now? Some of you might go, no, I mean, I'm still in my flesh, Pastor. Uh, uh, you may be uh, in it, but you're not of it. You're actually cut off from it, even though you're still inside the flesh. It's that soul right here. See this red marker here? That's your spiritual nature. That's the real you. The real you, which is in red right here, is cut off, notice, from the flesh. This is you, not the purple. The purple is your sin. Why do you think Christians say that the flesh is dead to us? You ever wondered that? Why? Because it's not really you. That's what the Bible's pointing out. This is the real you, the red. That's your spiritual nature. That's your uh, soul being cut off from the body, being born again with the spirit. The purple is your old man, your old nature, your flesh, which God considers dead, which God says is crucified. It's nailed. It's killed. Okay. So go to Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2. And then I want you to go to one more passage. Uh, I want you to go to the book of John. Keep your hand at Colossians 2 and then your other one to go to John. That way we can match this together. Go to John 19. Go to the book of John 19. Now, this is cool. Look at this. Um, Hebrews... What did it say at Hebrews uh, chapter 1 that we looked at last time, at our uh, last Hebrew study class? You don't have to turn there, but I'll read it to you again. This is where we left off at Hebrews 1. It mentioned, now look at this. This is so cool right here. Aren't you glad for being a Bible believer? Amen. If you're a Bible believer, you get this kind of doctrine. All right, in Hebrews chapter 1, let me read it again to you, verse 12. And as a vesture, which is his universe, remember, his clothing, Shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Remember what that, uh, remember that verse? God is going to one day fold up the universe and calls it his vesture. So one day God's going to get rid of his clothing and show his nakedness. Now the closest that God did that besides Hebrews 1, you can think of, the only other time you can think of God ever doing something like that was Calvary. Oh, yeah. So look at right here. So this is Calvary. In John 19, Jesus got rid of his vesture. Look at right here. John 19, verse 24. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it. That's Jesus' vesture. But cast loss for it. Whose uh, cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my what? Vesture. Vesture. They did cast lots. Look at this. So it's not just Hebrews 1 that God will someday do that with his vesture. John 19, he did that before already. Yeah. So think about this. Jesus is without sin. So he is without sin. He got rid of his vesture. When he gets rid of his vesture, he is born from a human line. But he did no sin. This human line where he did no sin, he took upon the shame and the sin of mankind upon his naked flesh. That's why it was important for God to have naked flesh when he came on this earth because he can't put the sin on his holy self. That goes in conflict. 
So that's why he had to take on the flesh of mankind because that birth is already corrupted, that line, that fleshly line. But Jesus Christ, he had to be a substitute for that. So he, it's important he didn't do any sin. That why what can be applied to his birth and flesh is sin itself from other people. So he's substituting for mankind. See that? That's why Christ is our substitute. That's what the Bible says. So think about this. Jesus Christ had to be naked for you and I. Why? Because if you and I stood in our nakedness at the great white throne of judgment, all of that is sin and shame. So Jesus Christ had to take the sin and shame of mankind from their naked flesh and put it on his naked flesh. So Jesus Christ hung on the cross of Calvary naked in utmost shame and taking every sin upon his naked flesh. Do you understand now why that was important? Wow, that's good. Come on. See that? That's the reason why Jesus Christ had to do that. So Colossians 2, notice what the verse says. How we got spiritual circumcision, how we got saved from this shame and shame, uh, the, excuse me, this shame and sin from birth and openness to nakedness is because all of that was applied on the cross. Jesus' naked flesh on the cross. All of that was nailed to his cross. That's why we can get cut off from this black part right here and enter to this red part, spiritual circumcision. Does that make any sense right here? Yeah. Let, me, let me just, okay, so let me show you this again. So notice right here, see this dot, the cross of Calvary? Right here is what draws the boundary line. See that? That's divided. That's cut off. You might say, why? Because of the cross of Calvary. The cross of Calvary is what cut this stuff off from us. So we're no longer here, we're here. Why? Because of that cross. Is this making any sense? Okay, good. Then go to <clears throat> uh, Colossians 2. Notice that the verse uh, clearly says that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, verse 11 in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So that's a spiritual circumcision, not physical. In, notice right here, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. So see, we are cut off completely right here from sin, this naked sinful flesh. We're cut off completely right here by the circumcision of Christ, right? What happened to that? Look at verse 14, uh, verse 13, 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, right? Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, what? Nailing, Nailing it to his cross. How about that? So notice right here that the sinful, uh, the sinful nature which is connected to the Old Testament law that condemned and exposed sin, was all nailed to the cross of Calvary. So Jesus Christ crossed through that boundary line. That's why we're here, spiritual circumcision. And then our birth now, naked came I out of my mother's womb. Our seed has been corrupted, right? That's why you need physical circumcision. But now because of spiritual circumcision, we're, we no longer have corruptible seed or corruptible birth. We are incorruptible. We're born again from incorruptible seed. So go to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Now this all makes sense, right? The new birth, why that's important. Why Jesus had to be naked on the cross. Why the Old Testament Jews practiced circumcision. Why the cross of Calvary is connected to spiritual circumcision. You know, why the flesh in nakedness has to be covered. Why people who are brought before the great white throne judgment in front of God in his openness without his clothing would have to go to the lake of fire and not live in heaven with him. See, all of this makes sense now, this doctrine. This doctrine makes sense now. This doctrine will connect all these dots together. Now go to 1 Peter 1, <clears throat> verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of what? Incorruptible. We are born again from incorruptible seed. Receiving the spiritual circumcision, 
That's why Paul said to the Old Testament Jews, you don't have to do circumcision. See that? But that's the reason why the Old Testament Jews thought you need physical circumcision. Why? That's why we believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. If you don't believe in that doctrine, you're going to be very uncomfortable in this church, and then what you're going to find out is dispensationalism teaches there is a change. Old Testament is different from New Testament. Right. Everybody is a closet dispensationalist, whether you believe it or not. You might say, why? You have a Bible called Old Testament, New Testament. All right? Whether you believe it or not, you believe that there were changes throughout the time periods that God did. Okay, now let's go back to Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter 1. All right, let's look at verse 13. If you believe in dispensationalism, then you're going to enjoy uh, this part of the teaching I'm going to give. If you don't, then uh, go ahead, feel uncomfortable, all right? You're in the wrong church. You're in the wrong church, I'll tell you that much. All right, let's look at Hebrews chapter 1, and then we'll look at verse 13. The Bible says, But to which of the angels said he at any time? Uh, so when did God ever say to any of his angels at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. When did he ever tell them, hey, sit on my right hand? So we can guess that's Jesus Christ sitting on the throne at the right hand of the Father, right? And to sit on his right hand until when? Until he makes sure that all of Jesus' enemies uh, become his footstool. So that's Amen. a figurative language, meaning that they're going to submit under his authority. They're going to bow and kiss his feet. We can guess verse 13 is Jesus Christ. And again, that is confirmation of Jesus' superiority above the angels by sitting on the right hand of the Father when other angels have never uh, received such a high position. Now remember, I, the whole point of Hebrews 1, the author, is to show off the superiority of Jesus above all other angelic creatures. So Hebrews 1 is evidence of that. But it's more so than that. This is a very great passage to debunk Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons because they believe that Jesus was a very special angelic being, a special being that could have a lesser God title. But as we've noticed right here at Hebrews chapter 1, it's not just Jesus Christ is such a special angelic being. He is so much more that he is called God himself by God himself. Hebrews 1 is the best chapter ever Amen. that shows the superiority of Jesus Christ above heavenly creatures that you can show to Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons, but it's even more so because he is God himself. All right, so, we've, so there's so many check marks to this. So he... Why would the author do that? I believe that because he's writing to Hebrews, see that? Jews, he has to prove Jesus is God. So that's the reason why he has to give this case about Jesus Christ being superior to all angelic creatures. That's the whole point of Hebrews 1 that we looked at, and even Hebrews 2 that we're going to find out in some parts. So we know that verse 13 is about Jesus Christ. God only said that to Jesus. He never said that to any other angelic creature. Now, this supports the postponement theory. Okay, go to Acts 7. All right, keep your hand at Hebrews 1. Go to Acts 7. This is extremely interesting here. Some of you might go, what is the postponement theory? I never heard of that. So I have a video on that one. So you can check it out if you want to. Postponement theory. I forgot the title uh, of that video, but it's something about um, the kingdom being postponed or something. But anyway, Clarence Larkin talks about this, so I'll just talk about it right here. The postponement theory is as follows. So remember, uh, when Jesus Christ came down on the earth, he was offering the kingdom to the Jews. What did the Jews do? They rejected their king, right? They did not receive him. So because the Jews rejected their king, in Acts chapter 2, which we looked at before in Acts 3, we looked at that before in our other Hebrew classes. So I'm not going to do it again, okay? So you've already heard the postponement theory. I'm just reviewing again in case people forgot. So in Acts 2 and Acts 3 and Acts 4, I pointed out to you that God was giving them a chance 
to receive their king, even though they rejected him before. They were anticipating God to come down any moment to set up his kingdom. So believe it or not, God's kingdom could have been set up at the first centuries. All right? It could have been set up long time ago. The rapture could have happened. The tribulation could have already undergone all the way. The Antichrist, the one world government, was already there through the power of Rome. That could have been all over with and done before. And then we could have been already in heaven or in the millennium or we wouldn't exist, all right, either or, all right? But the point is, is that God's kingdom could have already came. But we know what happened. 2,000 years passed. So what does that mean? That means that during this 2,000 years under the church age, it was postponed. So meaning, let me repeat again then, they had their chance at the book of Acts. But because they rejected him again, God had to postpone it for 2,000 years. That's what it means. The Jews were anticipating any moment. That was evident in Acts 1, 2, 3, 4. I mean, even people who are into eschatology will see that. The disciples, whether Jew, Gentile, Christian, or whatever, the point is they were anticipating any moment for the kingdom to come. They were anticipating for the rapture to come. That's the reason why we Christians believe in the imminence of the rapture, pre-trib rapture. It can happen any moment. Why? Because that has been the mentality of the Jews, the early church, and everybody from uh, all that time. Yeah. All right? That's the reason why. So they were anticipating for it to come. Why? Because it could have happened at their time. But then God, he was going to bring it down at their time, but he had to postpone it because they rejected. What's the evidence for that though, right? That God could have brought it down during their time, but because they rejected, he had to postpone it. The evidence is as follows. Hebrews 1.13 He's Jesus is supposed to sit, which we know, right? When Jesus went up to heaven, he's supposed to sit until when? Until the enemies become his footstool. That's his kingdom. All right? Ah, you Bible believers. All right. Now it's not Sean. It's Rob and other people. All right? So they're already connecting dots and doing that. Sean's like, I already know, Pastor. I've been connecting it long ahead. You know? So he's quiet now. So the thing is, is that uh, when you look at... Uh, this passage, the enemies become Jesus' footstool. That's his kingdom, right? That's when he brings in the kingdom, correct? All right. He didn't bring in the kingdom yet, correct? Yeah, he didn't bring in the kingdom yet. It's all the devil's kingdom right now, all right? Jesus Christ is going to set up his kingdom one day and kick out the Antichrist and the devil one day. But it's not, it's not there yet, all right? So think about this. Jesus, let me repeat again. Jesus is supposed to sit on the throne at the right hand of the Father until, see, he's supposed to sit down there, not move. He's supposed to sit down there until, uh, you know, he brings in the kingdom, all right? Now look at this. Then if he, get, if he moves from that position, if he doesn't sit, if he's standing up, then what are you going to assume? Oh, he's going to bring in the kingdom then. Right. He's going to make his enemies his footstool. Didn't you know that did happen? Acts 7. All right. So we saw that before, right? But let's repeat it again. Go to Acts 7. He's not sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's standing. He's standing. Go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. See, he's getting up from his seat. He was going to uh, start the rapture. He was going to start something. Go to Acts chapter 7, and then verse 55. This is Stephen. He's preaching to them. So this was their last chance. Acts chapter 7, verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus, what? Standing at the, on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the what? Heavens open, like the rapture's about to hit. See that? He's going to bring in the kingdom. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of what? God. All right. Keep your hand here. Now go to Matthew. All right. Look at this. This is crazy, the wording. All right. Keep your hand at Acts. All right. Keep your hand at Acts. Go to the book of Matthew. And then we'll look at chapter 26. Matthew 26, verse 64. 
what did Jesus say? Jesus was talking about one day he is going to uh, come down out of heaven to set up his kingdom. Look at Matthew 26, 64. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said that nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall he see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. And what? Coming in the clouds of heaven. Oh, amen. Then why is uh, heaven being opened up here? And he's not sitting, he's standing. Mm -hmm. See? So what's it pointing out? It's pointing out that he was about to bring in the kingdom. But then we know what happened. They rejected Stephen's message. They rejected the kingdom. Coincidentally, then as soon as that was over, Acts chapter 8 verse 1 is Paul to the what? Not Gentiles, uh, not to the Jews, but to who? Gentiles. See, that's why it shifted from Jew to Gentile. That's the reason why God had to uh, reject the nation of Israel. That's right, the nation of Israel is rejected by God, and God is now using the Christian church, not the nation of Israel. So God had to reject them. But because of his promise to Israel, it's a temporary thing. One day in the future, he will uh, give them another chance. Amen. And at that time, the Jews will receive their Messiah. Okay, but anyway, that's the reason why we see, see everything's making sense. This is a doctrine called dispensationalism. It makes so much sense. For some of you who don't know, uh, please watch our video, Amazing Dispensational Truth from Genesis to Revelation. If you even look at nearly all of our recent videos, there's links, and then you'll see an Amazon book link. That will give you the booklet version of it. All right, so that'll be incredibly eye-opening. All right, let's go back. But you can go to our uh, Hebrews chapter one, Hebrews one. You can go to our dispensationalism playlist. All right, we have a playlist called Dispensationalism. You can watch as much as you can until you're convinced that di dispensationalism is real, all right? So I dealt with all kinds of arguments against it, all right, uh, that were against dispensationalism, and then I've, uh, and I've introduced uh, arguments that were for dispensationalism as well. All right, now let's look at verse 14. All right, now, are they not all uh, ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Okay. Uh, the author is asking a question, are not the angels, aren't all of them spirits who minister and they are sent forth, they are uh, sent by God to minister or to serve those who are heirs of salvation. All right, so who are the heirs of salvation? Now, obviously in our mind, uh, people will first think Christians right here. So then the angels, I've, uh, that's a confirmation statement. Uh, the author already mentioned that before at uh, verse 7, right? Verse 7. So the author's repeating again about the angels. He's confirming that, that they are ministers. But now we're going to examine who are the heirs of salvation here. So who are the heirs of salvation that the angels minister to? Now commonly, the most common interpretation people will say are Christians. So go to Titus 3. <clears throat> Titus chapter 3. The reason why is uh, you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. So because you are a saved Christian, you're considered to be an heir. So that's just a, a common sense thinking that a lot of people will assume when they read that passage. All right, go to the book of Titus and we'll look at chapter 3. <clears throat> look at verse 7. Verse 7. That being justified by his grace. All right, are you saved by grace through faith? If so we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So notice that you're an heir of salvation right here. A lot of times I will use this verse to point out that's why angels will serve Christians for eternity. Now, there's a second application right here, all right? It could be Christians or Dr. Ruckman believes it's not Christians actually. He believes it is tribulation saints. And to be honest, the context will more strongly point out to be tribulation saints. So go to Hebrews 1 again. Hebrews 1. All right. Verse 14, heirs of salvation. What's your clue for that one? The first clue is, so these people inherit oh. salvation. See that? Yeah. So that sounds like you're earning, you're working for it. That's what heir means. Now, you can go around it by saying that, you know, we become an heir because of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So... 
I am open to that. However, the context is uh, we can see what this salvation context is. How do you inherit salvation at verse 14? The very next verse, see this? Look at this, very next verse, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them what? Wow. So then, because you are an heir of salvation at verse 14, you got to pay attention or you can slip. So notice right here, you can lose salvation. Look at verse 3. This is no doubt talking about losing salvation. How shall we, see the author is including himself as a saved person. How can we escape if we what? Neglect, Neglect so great salvation. What do you mean? I thought once saved, always saved. I thought when you receive salvation that it won't slip. You can't neglect it. No, uh, you can. That's what the author is pointing out right here. So is this saved Christians? No. The simple answer is notice the title of your book, Hebrews, yeah. right? Notice the timeline is tribulation. What's the evidence? We saw at verse 2. Verse 2, hath in what? These last days. So it's talking about last days. Jews in the last days. So remember, uh, you know this, Christians... We are in the church age, not in the tribulation, all right? If you think Christians go through the tribulation, then you jumble up a lot of scriptures and you don't know your Bible, all right? So notice right here that Christians get, we're in the church age, so we get raptured. So we can't lose salvation. People always use Hebrews to talk about losing salvation. But the author is speaking to Hebrews, not the Christian church. So Christian church can't lose their salvation. That's what we argue, and they get raptured. Raptured before the tribulation. So then God is going back to who? The Jews again. The Jews are concentrated upon again now because the church is gone. Because the Jew is concentrated again. That's why the tribulation is for the Jews. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the verses and prove it, all right? So I'm just trying to go through these three categories. But the proof is Daniel chapter 9. The 70th week, which is a tribulation, is for the nation of Israel. It says, to thy holy place, to Jerusalem, all right? And then it also pointed out in, uh, oh, what was it, uh, Matthew 24, about the tribulation, the end, that it is for those who are in Judea and those who keep the Sabbath. That's Jew right there. Jew, Jew, Jew. And in Romans chapter 11, Paul said that the, uh, God will go back to the Jews. Amen. See that? He said that the Jews were rejected, Gentiles replaced, but the Gentiles will be rejected again and go back to the Jew. Romans 11 said that. So that's why it makes sense that God's promise to the Jews, even though he rejected them now, according to Romans 11, Romans 11 repeated, he'll go back to the Jews again. See, it makes so much sense. It harmonizes. So notice right here that this is for tribulation saints, Jews. It just makes so much sense. The scriptures line up well. Now, a third application, which is very interesting, is so then it could be Christians saved by faith. It could be tribulation saints who have to endure, uh, cling on to their salvation. But it also could be millennial saints. It could be millennial saints. So go to Isaiah 65. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 65. So it could be an application where God is speaking to Jews in the tribulation, but he wants them uh, during the millennium to know what the salvation will be in the millennium, what they're going to have to do so that their generations can live. Because the, the reason why I say that is because, notice this is not really to tribulation saints, the, the specific address. The specific address is a nationality, a nation. Hebrews, right? That's the title of the book. So if it's something that's very, uh, that's specified to a nation, what did God say about a nation during the millennium? All right, go to Isaiah 65. Uh, this is pretty interesting here. Verse 9, verse 9. Notice how they are saved, okay? Isaiah 65, 9. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains. And mine elect shall what? Oh, so this is talking about heir, inheritance. See that? 
But um, there's not really tribulation verses we can find on that for tribulation saints, see? So that's the reason why we would have more of an application to millennium, because it's talking about inheriting something. It's talking about earning something. So then they're inheriting, and my servants shall dwell there. Now this whole context is millennium, there's no doubt about that. God's kingdom is set up on the earth. Uh, let's look at verse 22, 22. They shall not build, and another inhabit. They shall not plant, and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect, remember that's Jews, all right, shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed, uh, of, the blessed of the Lord, and their what? Offspring with them. So then their offspring has to be part of the group that inherits. See that? They have to be part of the group that will inherit. How does the offspring inherit? It's the tree of life. Go to Revelation 22. That's why that tree of life shows up at the end of the tribulation. All right? This is not during the tribulation. This is the end of the tribulation. So this is like millennium and beyond. So go to Revelation 22. <clears throat> 22 verse 2. So God says that in Isaiah 65, the Jews... Their offspring will live and inherit it, right? So how do you live and inherit the land forever, for eternity? Yes, the tree of life. That's why they have to eat that. God says you have to eat this tree of life so that you can, your offspring, uh, so that the people can live forever in the millennium and beyond. So that makes sense on how the offspring of millennial saints, their children and their children's children, children's children's children, and everybody who gets born after them will be able to keep inheriting it. So that's why they need that tree of life. So go to Revelation 22. Notice in verse 2, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the what? Healing of the nations. It's specific nation, and it heals them, keeps them going. Okay, then. Let's go back to uh, Hebrews uh, 1 and 2. Hebrews 1 and 2. <clears throat> so we see that the heirs of salvation, it could be referring to Christians who are saved by faith, or it could be tribulation saints who endure, but then the one, the, the group that seems to stick out the strongest, that would make sense, is millennial saints who partake in that tree of life. All right, let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, and let me um, flip the board here, all right? And then let me know up to which angle I should switch it. All right, there we go. All right, a little more right, left, or... So right here, this way? Yep. Uh, right, oh, just All right, right there. Okay, thank you. Let's go to uh, Hebrews 2, and then we'll look at verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. So the author argues that's why you ought to pay more attention. That's what give the more earnest heed means. So earnest, like you're trying hard. Heed is... Uh, listening, paying attention. You got to give the, the more serious attention to what you've already heard, the things we have heard. That's what it means. Lest at any time we should let them slip. You got to pay serious attention to what you've heard. Otherwise, sometime, anytime, you can let those things slip from you. And that's referring to salvation. So notice right here, they have to maintain it, this seriousness to them. So this is not Christian doctrine. We can see clearly it screams uh, Jewish, it's Jewish doctrine, whether tribulation or millennium. Verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, uh, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Okay, so meaning then uh, in verse 2, so let me explain every word. So look at the verse. That way you can f agree, all right, with how I explain it. If the word that was spoken by angels, the, the word of angels is sure, it's steadfast. That means it's certain. 
It doesn't break. And every sin that is committed, that's what transgression disobedience is, breaking the law, if they went against the word of those angels, they received in return a just recompense of a reward, a fair penalty in return. So there is a just and equal penalty for breaking the word of angels. Wow, that's something. That's why uh, the author says, if that's what happens at a word of angels, how much more at verse 3, if a word that is spoken by Jesus Christ. So then if it breaks that, how can you... Uh, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So we can escape that. That's why we have to take our salvation seriously, this Jewish author argues. So notice right here, it shows a losing of salvation. A losing of salvation, according to this Jewish author. A huge penalty, all right? That's pretty serious. That don't sound Christian, you notice that. A lot of people will try to make the book of Hebrews talking about Christians, especially once saved, always saved. That's ludicrous. There's no way you can do that. If you're going to be very honest, it talks about losing salvation. So then do Christians teach losing salvation? No, dispensationalism. This is to Hebrews, not saved Christians. This is to Hebrews. So this would make sense if we fit it at the tribulation timeline. All right, now, uh, explaining this part, the word spoken by angels, it is certain. And then you received a penalty if you broke that one. All right, this word spoken by angels is go to Galatians 3. That's referring to the law of Moses. So a lot of people don't know that. When the law of Moses was given, those were the words spoken by angels. So the author of Hebrews is saying, if that Old Testament law was broken, you received a penalty for that, a fair penalty. But how much more so with what? The word of Jesus. And those Jews undergoing the tribulation, they could lose their salvation. It's even more serious. See, that really shows language about losing salvation, a serious penalty, not just a saved Christian who's going through chastisement from God. All right, that sounds very mellow compared to what the language the author is saying. All right, so go to Galatians chapter 3, and then Exodus 21, all right? It's going to be Exodus 21, and then uh, Galatians 3, all right? <clears throat> Uh, hopefully the AC is at 70 or 71, all right? It's not lower than that, all right? All right, Galatians chapter 3. Uh, notice right here at Galatians chapter 3, it talks about in verse 19, Galatians 3, and then uh, verse 19, Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions. So remember what um, the author of Hebrews said, transgression, disobedience against the word of angels. All right, would this be this Old Testament law? Yes, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So notice right here, the angels uh, proclaim this word through the hand of this mediator, but we know who that mediator is. It's God. Now go to Exodus 21. So then notice right here, this is the Old Testament law, that it should not be broken. Uh, otherwise, you will receive a just penalty for that one. So go to Exodus chapter 21. Notice the just penalty for breaking the law. Now Exodus 21 is the entire Old Testament law given. So notice right here that uh, a just penalty is given at verse 23. Exodus 21, 23. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe, etc. So notice right here, a just penalty whenever breaking the Old Testament law. And this was given by angels. All right, let's go to Hebrews again. Hebrews chapter 2. So then in verse 3, again, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So how can we, the author says, as a Hebrew, how can we escape such a serious consequence if we neglect if we overlook, if we put aside such a great salvation that is given to us. By who? Jesus Christ. Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. So this was first, this word was first spoken by Jesus Christ himself, the Lord. And was confirmed unto us. So it, this word of Jesus Christ is confirmed to us. How is this confirmed to us? by the apostles, 
The apostles are the confirmation of Jesus' word. Notice right here, by them that heard him. Why? Who are the ones that heard Jesus Christ saying the words? That's the 11 apostles. So it's the apostles. Notice what accompanies these apostles, verse 4. God also bearing them witness. So these 11 apostles, God bore witness to them. All right, so he gave, they are his witnesses. He give, given them evidence. What's the evidence? Both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So God uh, confirmed the evidence to his apostles with signs, wonders, all sorts of miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost that was according to his will. So then the author, in context, since it's a question mark at the end, verse 3 and 4, basically he's saying in totality, uh, in verse 2, 3, and 4, let me say it in totality here, if the word spoken by angels, it's certain that you received a just, re, uh, just punishment, equal punishment for that. How much more is the serious punishment, the serious consequence for us Hebrews who received that word from Jesus Christ when it was confirmed through the evidence of the apostles and their signs, how much more serious of a consequence is to us if we try to neglect that salvation? So notice right here that it doesn't, it really sounds contrary to Christian doctrine, yeah. typical Christian doctrine. We are already saved, but this sounds like a, a group of people who are being saved or earning salvation right. as Hebrews. So this is very different language right here. Now, remember the apostles, they were expecting, remember the postponement theory? They were ministering to Jews. So see, they were expecting that kingdom to come. So tribulation doctrine for Jews can already be underway. See that? That's the reason why the book of Hebrews, it's as if it was written at a time that was still in that transitional moment in the book of Acts where they were still dealing with Jews, but it was slowly transitioning to Gentiles. So if the author was Paul, like I told you before, the best, uh, the best time period to put this in is when he was in that desert being trained by the Lord in Arabia. So he's writing about his people because he's a Jew of the Jews, but at that time he's starting to learn uh, the body of Christ doctrine, Christian doctrine. So right here, he's still fresh right here, writing uh, Jewish doctrine for Jews while he's still learning. Christian doctrine. Because Christian doctrine took several years for Paul. It's not like you and I where we can learn it in six months under discipleship. Because why? This is very new. This is very new. Even Paul said that at Galatians 1. It was a new revelation not given to any other but to him. So that proves Christian doctrine is very different. Uh, if, it's, if it was the same Christian doctrine as the Old Testament tribulation and everything, if that's what you think during the book of Acts, then you really don't know your Bible, man. You really don't know your Bible. Dispensationalism is no doubt a fact. Okay, now, this is very important, is that if you look at this board right here, confirmed unto us, right? That's what verse 3 said. So that's believers, right? We're confirmed. We receive the confirmation of the signs. But we're not the ones oh, doing God. the signs. By them that heard him with signs. Those are apostles. Good. Now, why is that important? Amen. That points out that the signs, the charismatic blah, 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 oh. is a bunch of nonsense. Right. That is not for, say, believers. Right. That is only given to apostles. Yeah. Well, the apostles are dead and long gone. So you got to realize that this was only something that was in the apostles. Uh, that's why it's called Acts of the Apostle. Yep. They're acts of showing the signs and wonders. Yep. But if you look at Romans through Philemon... That doesn't have to do with signs and wonders. This is all Christian doctrine. Okay, so uh, Mark 16 is a favorite charismatic passage. All right, Mark 16. <laughs> but what you're going to find out in Mark 16, it's the same thing with Hebrews 2, verse 3. Signs are confirmed to believers, but the ones who are actually doing it are apostles, not us. Go to Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any, de any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So notice right here that this is their proof text that, that uh, say believers have the signs and wonders. But no, it just simply says the signs follow the believers. 
So notice right here, the believers, they were able to have signs following them because of the apostles. So believers are not doing the signs apostles are. You want evidence? The evidence is, why did sick believers go to the apostles to heal them? That's right. If they had the signs and wonders. See that? That don't make sense. So only the apostles had it. See that? Uh, here's another thing. Look at verse 20. Verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. Who is they? The context is verse 14. And afterward he appeared unto the what? That's the apostles. So the apostles, verse 20, and the apostles went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and what? Confirming the word with signs following, amen. See that? So notice right here, the apostles had the signs. That was confirmed to us believers. All right. So again, signs are confirmed to us, yes, but that doesn't mean we're doing the sign. What that means is apostles are doing the signs to confirm to us believers that what we're preaching to you, the word from Jesus, is true. So that's why Hebrews chapter 1, uh, Hebrews 2, verse, three and, uh, verse 2 and 3, it's saying right here that the word was confirmed to us Jews, right, mm -hmm. by, the by the signs of the apostles because they're carrying on the word of Jesus. The verse said first, uh, in verse 3, it was first began to be spoken by the Lord, Jesus. Then, con and this word of Jesus is confirmed through the apost apostolic signs. That's right. Mark 16 pointed that, the last verse. The words of Jesus were confirmed to the apostles because they gave out the signs. All right? So it's all matching together. Go to 2 Corinthians 12. Notice right here, it's the signs of an apostle, not the signs of a believer. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 12, and then we'll read verse 12. 2 Corinthians 12, and then verse 12. Good stuff. Notice right here, the Bible says, truly the signs of a what? Apostle, Apostle were wrought among what? Among you. you, that's uh, you believers. So the, the apostolic signs, all right? If I say the car of Gene Kim, that ain't your car, all right? And I ain't sharing my car with you. That's my car. So if it says signs of an apostle, that means that's the, the signs belong to the apostle. If I say the word of God, that ain't your word. That ain't my word. That's God's word. So of shows a belonging right there. All right. Yada da. We will wrap it up here. All right. So signs are given to apostles, not believers. All right. All right, there's so many other stuff that we're going to cover. That's going to be fun, all right? That's going to be fun. So we'll cover all this later on, all right? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching has been uh, help, uh, a blessing to the people. Fed, fed your people. Help us grow more in doctrine of the scriptures, Lord. Uh, dismiss us now with your blessing. Protect uh, us, your people, and help us all to get home safely. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.